it, you're, you're going to be missing out on an opportunity to get a token that's going to appreciate a lot if you dump your e-hex. Uh, so I was thinking about the game theory of this, like why, why wouldn't somebody dump their e-hex? Well, the reason is you don't dump it if you understand that you can put it into a liquidity pool and earn the equivalent of cake token when it starts at zero. So that's, that's the actual most likely best move possibly other than staking. So dissemination of that idea is what's going to help the price of EHEX from dumping. You're saying you think it's wise to, to um, put EHEX into liquidity pools on the Ethereum side, Ruth? No, uh, so you'll bridge your EHEX over, right? And you'll put it into liquidity pools on the Pulse Chain side uh, into an EHEX PHEX pair. And you'll be earning the uh, governance token, so the Pulse Swap token. Uh, and that token is going to appreciate much more than the the sort of one to one gain that you're going to get just by selling your ehex on the way down, assuming that everybody sells their ehex. So everybody is actually Hello? better off by putting their their ehex and phex in a liquidity pool and earning a pulse swap token. That's a great point. You don't have to dump your ehex. You you really don't. The gains that you're going to get from that pulse swap token are going to be insane, right? So you don't want to miss out on your opportunity to get that. And you're also going to be helping the entire community and yourself by keeping the price of eHex up by not dumping it. So I, I really like paced around for a while trying to figure that out. And, and that is actually the solution, specifically disseminating this idea that you're better off, not because it's a good idea to disseminate, but because it's true. You're actually going to be better off if you have an opportunity to earn that governance token for free, because that's going to appreciate much faster in the short term than anything else that you're going to be holding. I mean, of course, other than impulse so you know that doesn't i mean i appreciate the the, the cake swap uh, analogy or whatever but you know if my goal is to get uh to, to try and get cheap key hex at the beginning to gain my t-share position because i've put in the work i've watched hundreds and hundreds of hours of videos and research and i understand the value of the t-share that doesn't give me more t-shirts <laughs> um okay you know what's that you know, so, do you hold on so to I, goals, I, I, do you swap your well. with hex right at the beginning? You know, what's the, what's the ideal path to, to trying to get cheap t-shirts right at the beginning? So I'll address one one point and then I'll let somebody else answer your later question. So you started with uh, the notion of wanting to acquire cheap uh, t-shirts on the pulse chain side. That's completely reasonable. Um, however, by deflating the value of e-hex, you're actually working against yourself there's two mechanisms that could occur. So the entire value of EHEX is transferred to PHEX because everybody thinks the way that you're thinking. And it's not a bad way to think. It's actually sort of like one of the, it's kind of like an idea attractor. So because it sounds so reasonable, a lot of people are going to think that way and they're going to be attracted to the idea and they're going to bolster it and more people are going to act that way. And what you're actually going to get as a result is a negative cascade on the EHEX price side. Now, the reason that this is relevant is because there's actually, you can think of it as like a, a little bit of a theorem. So in the case of most airdrops, there's going to be a perceived increase in value of the airdrop. So the consequence, sorry, a perceived increase in value of a token as a consequence of the airdrop. So in our case in particular, um, what's going to happen is there's going to be a copy. And usually what happens is the, the increase in price uh, just immediately goes away after the airdrop is over. So there's going to be a redistribution event. If you're dumping the value of eHex, you're actually hurting yourself on both sides, irrespective of which token you acquire, either eHex or PHEX, because you're artificially increasing the velocity at which the price decreases after the airdrop. The reason that it's artificial is because there's this thought attractor that I just mentioned, and you're being sucked into that, which is, oh, I'm going to get uh, cheap t-shares on the other side. Well, sure, that might be the case for a while, but ultimately you're going to be decreasing the, the value, the, the perception of the value of the token. Uh, and then you, you have to do some math um, and ask yourself, is the increase in the price of the governance token going to be greater than the increase in the price of the, the t-shares that I bought? And the answer to that is most likely yes. So because because your, your governance token that you're gonna get is gonna increase in value faster, you're more likely to do better by positioning yourself in such a way to earn the governance token to then buy T-shares that are going to be, they're gonna to continue to be valuable, but you've earned more money faster so you can earn, so you can pay for more T-shares later. And you also end up protecting the price. 
of everything. That, that's my take on it. it. Might not be right, but that's just exposure to another way of thinking about the problem. So to, if I might just sum up briefly, Ruth, your strategy is to basically not do a whole lot of anything with, until the fork. And then after that, you are going to add, your, add the copies into liquidity pools. Yes. Yeah, that, that's, that's what I'm thinking the, the globally optimal strategy is. Um, and, and some of the things that you're optimizing for, well, at a high level, the one thing for which you're optimizing is just an accumulation in value um, through it as like a function of price. You say. So you're going to have more stuff that commands a higher price that's going to enable you to buy things that have a steady price increase. So, so you're more likely to see like uh, parabolic increases in price, parabolic increases in price for, for a governance token. Uh, whereas the the cost increase for T shares is, is fairly linear, and so there, there's a big difference in the way that those uh, that those graphs interact. And, and at one point they they intersect, and so when you find that intersection point, then then you can then you can sort of make some conclusions about what the ideal thing is. But the takeaway is it's most likely the case that the governance token will increase in value faster than um, than the number of T-shares at a cheap price that you could have accumulated, and thus you end up being able to buy more T-shares later because the governance token is worth so much more. Um, and the, the T-share price won't be cheap for long. So you're going to be suffering a lot of friction in terms of costs. One, one of the smartest things to do is, is to buy HEX and to not get rid of EHEX or PHEX and to take advantage of that pair for as long as you can until it becomes more profitable to buy T-shares because the maximum value of the governance token approaches, uh, it's, it's sort of like market defined asymptotic maximum. So you can kind of take a look at things like the value of cake and value of Uniswap, all, all sorts of other things. Like eventually they kind of like approach a, a sort of market ex accepted value. So unless there's some really unique value proposition associated with uh, pulse swap, which there very well could be, I thought of a few cool ones that I'm not gonna get into, you know, it's most likely to behave in the way that most governance tokens for just, uh, decentralized exchanges work. So you just gotta gotta figure out where the linear increase of t-share price meets the parabolic uh, price increase of the governance token, and you, you end up actually just helping everybody in the community without even trying to be helpful. If you just behave selfishly and take advantage of an opportunity that people never have, uh, which is just being able to take both sides of liquidity providing at a 50% discount, which is crazy. Like that's so cool. Um, and, and you end up better off with high probability, right? Like if nobody's buying PHEX, I mean, you know, but that's like really unlikely, right? So just, just one way to think. And I think it's a good way to think. I think overall it helps everyone, but also at a selfish level, I think you're better off that way. So the liquidity you're providing kind of scares me uh, just because I've heard all about the impermanent loss. I guess I don't understand enough about being a liquidity provider. So, so it kind of scares I, I, me. Discuss that. And, and this is this is one of the coolest aspects of the airdrop. Um, so as, as I mentioned, I you know, you might not have been here, but I'll do a little recap. So um, there there is a theorem. I, if it's, there's no name for it, but maybe Richard can make one up. Um, there's a theorem that essentially says after an airdrop, the, the price goes down, right? So price goes up for an airdrop, tokens get given out, and the price is redistributed and goes back down. Value may or may not stay there. Now, a cool thing uh, that's going to happen if you're providing liquidity with your p-hex and e-hex is that impermanent loss doesn't matter because the, the airdrop, because the airdrop theorem like applies in this case. And, and so the value gets redistributed. And if you end up with impermanent loss, it doesn't matter because you have both parts of the value redistribution. So that's like another reason why it's actually, you're better off uh, putting stuff into a liquidity pool. Now, like, would I feel comfortable like getting up on stage? Although technically, I guess I kind of am. And saying this without like doing a shitload of math? No, but this this is a I'm making a kind of a high level heuristic argument at this point based on some intuition about the dynamics of systems like these. So the impermanent loss thing, specifically for the p-hex and e-hex pair on pulse swap, is is almost like a a, a non consideration because you got half of it for free, right? So impermanent loss is, is really something worth considering when one of the sides goes up way more or goes down way more than the other. And so arbitrage lots will come in. But if, if, if the new attractor idea is everybody puts their stuff into a liquidity pool or right, of course they stake um, both sides, then 
then the impermanent loss stuff is not a big deal. Like it's actually a, a non-deal. It, it doesn't matter at all. So uh, the fees, like it's, I mean, the feed component, I mean, we're on Pulse Chain doing this, so it's not a big deal. Uh, the impermanent loss stuff, we, we have like this crazy dynamic that nobody else gets to take advantage of. So it's, it's not a big deal. So to can't recap that. Sit on my hands, don't do anything, provide liquidity. Uh, so yeah, provide liquidity, delegate your pulse, stake, stake both sides, right? So if you're going to stake 100 hex, also stake 100 p hex. So you, you really want to trap the the one the pair at a, at a ratio of one to one in the exact same way, right? And that's that's how we're going to reach value parity. And as uh, as understanding increases, well, the value is going to go up. You're doubling your bags if you don't sell half to get the other. Uh, thank you for explaining that in detail because there was a live stream from Richard Hart a while ago saying that his intention was to create something where you could pair the Ethereum hex and Pulse hex in a liquidity pool. This must be it. Right, that's the Pulse swap idea. There's actually a really, really, really cool like advanced idea um, that we might have a chance to build as well, but I'm not going to go into it. So there's going to be a lot of value attached to the governance token, which is the token that you get for putting your stuff in the liquidity pool on Pulse Swap, and I think it's going to be like the 400 IQ play. So I, I can't, I have not thought of a strategy that's better for the for at a selfish level and also at like a a global level. I think it approaches the maximum in both of those spaces, and and that's really cool because that doesn't usually happen. But I'd love to hear uh, ideas. That's the way we find better stuff. So when you were initially speaking of the uh, governance token, I thought you were talking about PLS, but you're talking about a different one that's going to be created for this uh this pull swap thing right so the governance token uh it's just kind of a name for like if you know what the uniswap token is if you've heard of the pancake swap cake token or like the one inch token that, that's kind of what i'm talking about so it's like this sort of reward thing it, it has voting capability for certain changes um so it's it's that kind of token. It's it's rewarded to liquidity providers. So it's it's in that kind of category. It may or may not have the the same properties, but that's sort of what I'm I'm referencing. And and yeah, so it turns out the like 800 IQ strategy is actually also the like 12 IQ strategy. Put the copied stuff either in a stake or in the uh, the uh, the pulse swap liquidity pool and just like win. So you, you do have to keep an eye on the price of. Uh, of T shares on the Pulse Chain side, and eventually they're they're going to become more expensive faster than the governance token is going to increase in price. But that's going to be after a while, so you're better off in the governance token for quite a while, maybe even like six months, maybe even a year. I, I don't know. I'd have to like sit down and do the math for how long. But so you're saying once once you kind of capture most a lot of that early appreciation, then you can go ahead and. Um state because the risk to reward is not in your favor at that point so of course uh this assumes right the strategy assumes that the uh the rate of increase in price of uh t shares from p hex um is going to reach the the current price very very quickly to the extent that you're going to suffer massive slippage and the the value that you lose on the on the fees from the slippage probably would have appreciated in a better way if it was allocated to the governance token. So, so there's a lot of assumptions here and there's lots of ways to poke holes or ask questions. And yeah, I mean, I, I, was, I was listening to you and I, I found so many assumptions there, like there will be parity between Ethereum X and Pulse X, uh, impermanent loss uh, does not matter, um, that the governance token will appreciate uh, quicker than the, anything else, even Pulse. So, oh, I mean, so if you have your ideas, uh, that's fine. But um, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of uh, assumptions in there. So there, there are a few great points. One of them is not an assumption. Though. One is a consequence of the theorem, right? So if if there's price distribution, which is generally the case, you know, as good as economic theorems can be, of course. So there's that caveat on top. But um, price redistribution across the tokens and you get 50% of the tokens for free. I, I'm specifically talking about the, the EHEX and PHEX case. I haven't considered any other tokens for this analysis, but uh, impermanent loss does not matter if the value is being redistributed in such a way that it is either uh, equal or greater to than the initial value between two tokens. 
So, and, and the very existence of the liquidity pools actually implies in the limit that those two tokens will be equivalent in value or roughly equivalent based on certain dynamics that are essentially, that are eventually found to be optimal. So you'll, you're gonna wanna have longer stakes on the EHEC side and shorter stakes on the on the PHEC side. So yeah, th there's a lot built in here and, and I'd love for you to challenge my assumptions, Francisco. Th those are amazing points, but uh, what I just spoke on is not necessarily a, a, an assumption. I, I think it is very much uh, a lemma, uh, which is a consequence of, of a theorem, which of course is an economic theorem. So almost worthless, but less worthless than random noise. And how people react to those prices is going to be different from what the, you know, the academic theorem suggests, you know, um, because if there's more network adoption or abandoning on one side versus the other, then the impermanent loss could become a problem over time. And, uh, and shorter stakes on one side will affect possible a dumplemental if people have are doing the purpose of much shorter stakes just to drain some money out over time, that could very, very true, great their, point. You know? um, I would I would say also to recall that, that we are very much talking about only the period uh, from t equals zero to to the intersection point between the the, the parabola intersecting with the linear uh, so the the price parabola the governance token intersecting with the linear increase in in the t share price. Um, so it's, it's a very small window. I don't know how long it is. I think it's on the order of months. I, I doubt it's on the order of one year. Um, but that's a, that's a great point. It is very much a crazy hard dynamical system to solve. So um, we are all poking around in the dark, myself included. Let, let's talk more about some of the assumptions though. So, so those are great points. And, and maybe some of the assumptions cannot be valid outside of that time window. And so I'd love to hear if that's the case, and then maybe we can we can iterate on our on our proposed uh, ideal. <laughs> well, just solution. just seeing how people don't typically always act in the interest of the most economic beneficial model, and more emotional <laughs> decisions are being made. I think uh, even sometimes you know personal decisions can be not efficient, and so understand it, it could just come down to knowing yourself and. Being able to just say, you know what, I'm just I'm not going to try to keep more of one versus the other. I'm not I'm just going to manage them on different chains. I'm just going to I'm not going to be interested in adding liquidity. I'm just going to keep staking, and I'm just going to keep participating in the staking model on both sides. Not trying to optimize anything. Not trying to jump lanes, so to speak, on a freeway. Right, that's and that's the uh, the degenerate case. So um, I would I would essentially call that equivalent, but uh, in a way that achieves less value capture because you, you are behaving in a parallel way, which essentially reduces the, the entire space to one token, right? So even though yep. you're, you're implementing roughly, uh, like relatively different strategies uh, on different chains, the, the, the tokens that you're using are, are the same on both chains. So the number of tokens. And so the, the impact of any kind of proportional disparity uh, across the two chains is right. minimized in that case. So it's, it's essentially equivalent to putting both tokens into a liquidity pool minus the governance token gains. Um, but but it's, the, the connection there is, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't bet a lot of money on on that holding true over a, a very large uh, sample size of events like these. So it might it might work this time, but on multiple like massive airdrops, I, I don't know if, if that would hold uh, based on like new revelations of like optimal data, et cetera. But it's uh, yeah. So well, if you're already a hundred percent staked or close to, it's one of the only options you have going across the fork. Right. Absolutely, and and it's not a bad option. Um, it's, it's probably both personally and globally the best option uh, because you you guarantee a, a capture of a certain number of T shares and. Uh, depending on when you stake, right? Like it, you, you might never get T shares that cheap ever. Um, even if, well, okay, maybe not. But there's a very small window for for cheap for cheap T shares on, on the pulse chain side. In my opinion, could be wrong. Uh, but like some of the bridge solutions that we're looking at are highly scalable, right? So like forty thousand TPS, that you know, and there's about a million Ethereum users. So. Uh, what is that? Maybe 15 seconds, you can get everybody across the bridge uh, who, who, right, who wants to put value there. Uh, so it, it's they're, they're gonna they're gonna get bought up pretty quick. It, in my opinion, assuming like a bridge that 
that's pretty good. And and I think it's possible that we're going to get one. We just need to wait a little bit longer to. Well, find was, it. Well, I was under the impression that the T-share rate gets copied over. So I, I, I yeah. You oh yeah, it does. But I just mean like in in current value. So you can get a T-share. Oh, you have like, dollar dollar value. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm not as technical as you two, but can I just, uh, I'm trying to understand the last point. So, so, so Staker's um, argument, well, not our argument point was, hey, why don't we just stay, uh, keep your e hacks on the Ethereum chain and, and let your P hacks kind of stay uh, on the Pulse chain. Am I, am I correct in, in that assumption, Staker? Is that what you said? Yep. I'm just managing so, them so, separately. Got it. So, so um, the counter to that was, uh, this is a unique situation, you know, so, so even if impermanent loss does happen, so let's say I'm providing liquidity, I, I bridge my, my hex over to, to, to pulse chain. Now, now let's say, you know, uh, price of P hex goes up more relative to, um, uh, E hex. Uh, so, so it, it's essentially like, you know, it would be the same case if you were on, uh, separate chains, uh, is, is that what your argument was, um, in favor of, of saying, yeah, so why does it matter if you provide liquidity, uh, unless you're staking, that's, that's a different scenario, but so it, am I understanding that correctly? Uh, okay, let, let me try to explain the, I, I'm not sure I quite understand what your question is, to be fair. So, um, so uh, maybe, maybe I, I don't understand it technically enough. So when you provide liquidity, let's say you're, you're, you're pairing EHEX and PHEX, um, if, if impermanent loss was, would occur, it would be because the price of one went up uh, a lot more than the other. Okay, so that, that would be the case normally. Um, however, you got part of it for free. Now, also, if there's propagation of this optimal strategy, throughout the community. The, the consequence is that there's, it becomes less, so I'll use a math way to talk about this first and then I'll bring it down more. So like in the limit, it becomes less likely that there won't be parity, which means even if you paid uh, two separate prices for both sides, um, well, I mean, we're supposing this, even if you paid two different prices for both sides, for the P-hex side, the E-hex side, you are less likely to suffer impermanent loss because we're, we're creating an optimal attractor here that puts all of the, the, the just by default via Hart's law, uh, which some of you, most of you are probably familiar with, uh, implies that the prices will eventually be the same. What that means is you, you can't suffer impermanent loss from the P-hex and hex stuff unless the value, the, the sum value of P-hex and E-hex is less uh, after the fork and dramatically less such that the value of the governance token that you receive for providing liquidity added to your current value is also less, which is extremely unlikely, especially if many people also do this. So I, I seem to be talking about it from like the global good perspective, but I'm actually not. This is one of the smartest things to do if you want to be selfish. Yeah, so it would be a, a projection of the value onto Pulse Chain. So, you know, like if we if we shined a flashlight behind some like figurine, it would have a shadow on the wall. And so the wall would be pulse chain and the shadow on the wall uh, would be E hex. And so we would take that shadow and put it into a, a box with P hex. And so I'm talking about the shadow. And so because uh, E hex is trapped on the bridge, right? Because value is not gonna disappear. You can think of it as being trapped on the bridge. Then, then it's essentially equivalent. So it's, it's functionally equivalent in that sense. So yes, I, I agree, you know, people could do some trades and eventually they could bring value back over and they could unlock their initial thing. But most likely what they're going to get is uh, another flashlight projection onto Ethereum with, with what they're bringing over. So that's why it's really important to have a bridge without admin keys that you can trust. Because over time, there's going to be a lot of value. Uh, you can think of like traps in front of flashlights on the bridge. I'm only going to be in this room for like 10 more minutes. So I'll be listening, but I won't answer questions afterwards. So basically, you're going to stake a hex, you're going to provide the liquidity, and you're going to delegate your pools. So it's three ways to make money from the start, right? right. And, and you want to do those things in one-to-one in -one ratios. So specifically, you want to, if you're going to put, like, so say you have 100 hex, 100 px, you, you might want to stake 100, uh, sorry, you might want to stake 50 of the hex, so like 50% staked and 50% in the pool. You, you want to, ideally, you want to keep those ratios the same because it gets a little bit more subtle. So the, the penalty for taking P hex out of a pool, well, there is no penalty for, for taking your hex out of a liquidity pool. You just don't earn the governance token anymore. So, so what you do is you make the truth engine associated with with hex, right? That tells you like these people have the ability to sell at this time. You, you make that truth engine weaker by by having asymmetric amounts. And so the truth engine is one of the things that keeps the hex price up. So 
you, you want to maximize the truthiness of the truth engine is one way to think of it. And so to do that, you want to have the same, same ratios staked, same ratios in the pool. So people can then know, like, okay, there's this much traps um, staked. So you know, our truth engine is very truthy on both sides. And if it's truthy on both sides in the same way, then we're more likely to reach parity. If we're more likely to reach parity, then that means we're more likely to see a lot of traffic going across the, the liquidity pools, which means you earn more governance token. You know, that's, that's a good thing. You know, if it's still appreciating at a, at a very fast rate within a very small time window. So um, basically, you, the idea is you want to do everything in parallel. So a, a like easy way to think about what parallel means is imagine you have a mirror image of yourself doing stuff, but left and right aren't switched. You're just watching yourself do what you're doing on the pulse chain side on the east side. And um, that will maximize the, the truth engine on both sides in a way that enables reaching parity. So the truth engine has the same truthiness on both sides, but you know if we want max value of hex like globally, which we do, trust me, um, then then you want to be as truthy on both sides, so that both truth engines are roughly the same. Now that there's going to be additional strategies that you can deploy on a pulse chain, right? Because of the cheaper fees, but I sort of view that as helping the little guys get staked and and sort of build up their stack over time. I, I feel like it's best used in that way, but there are other good uses too. But that's not worth getting into. So. Ruth, I've never heard you speak before, but I feel enriched. And I just want to let you know that I am quite grateful to be in the audience today hearing your wisdom. Thank you.